As I watched the child dedication this morning, uh, I, I was reminded I was preaching in the jungles of Belize one night and a little lean-to with one light bulb and a generator hanging right over my head. And uh, at the end of the service, the pastor wanted me to dedicate his baby. Well, I just did it in the typical American style, kind of like Brother Frank did, you know. I was, uh, you know, I, the parents came and, and held the baby and, and, uh, and I prayed for the baby. When I got through, I, first time in my ministry, I've had anybody just publicly in front of the crowd say, you didn't do it right. <laughs> you just didn't do it right. We want you to dedicate him to the Lord. And by that they meant, they wanted me to hold the baby and hold it up to the Lord and pray. And I'll never forget, somebody captured that on a picture. Uh, we didn't have uh, cell phones back then, but somebody got it. And uh, I treasured them capturing that moment of dedicating. It doesn't matter what culture we live in, does it? it the important thing is still the same. Train up a child in the way he should go. When should we start? Before he's ever born. Amen? Amen. Uh, before he is ever born. Well, those of you who were not here last Sunday morning, let me give you a quick running kind of review because we'll need to kind of uh, see where we're headed. We're in a three-sermon series entitled, The Seven Words of the Gospel. And we've selected uh, three texts. The first one, which we unpackaged for you last week is Psalm chapter 51. And in two verses in that Psalm, which was written by David right after having committed adultery with Bathsheba and orchestrating the murder of her husband Uriah, David is feeling the sting in his conscience. He is feeling a sadness in his soul. And, and, and so he's crying out to God, what can I do with this guilt that's eating me alive. And so in Psalm 51, verses 2 and 7, he prays this prayer, wash me. Remember that? Wash me. He's asking God to do something for him which he cannot do. He's saying, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So that's a prayer that David is praying to God to wash. Now today we move to Isaiah chapter 1 and in these verses which I will read in a moment and seek to unpackage he uses the phrase wash yourselves. Wash yourselves. After we have been washed by God after God does for us what only God can do then he commissions us challenges us, commands us really, to be about the business of being proactive in washing ourselves. Yes. In other words, in the pursuit of holiness. So the second two words in the seven words of the gospel, which we will deal with today, are wash yourselves. Now let me just give you a little advance notice of next week. John chapter 13, in the upper room where Jesus is meeting for the final time, with his disciples. And he says to them, as he practices uh, before them, uh, the, the, the act of washing their feet. Remember that? Where he washes their feet. And then he says to them, wash one another's feet. So the third, three, the last three words of the seven words of the gospel are these. Wash one another. There is a progression here. Wash me is salvation. Wash yourselves is sanctification. Wash one another is service to the Lord. Now, wash me is something we can't do for ourselves. Wash yourselves is something we can only do with the power of God, but we're commanded to take initiative in it. And then wash one another's feet is an act of obedience in service and gratitude to God for what he has done to us. So all of us fit in that place somewhere. We either need to be washed, or we need to wash ourselves, or we need to be actively engaged in service, 
washing one another's feet. Now today we move on to Isaiah chapter 1. And I want to read for you in Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, we're going to look at verses 12 through 18. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 12 through 18. little background here. This is, uh, uh, this is in the time when the, the northern kingdom has uh, just fallen or is about to fall. You know, they fell in 722 when uh, they were taken captive by, uh, by Assyria. And, uh, and, and Isaiah is seeing that dark cloud looming now over Judah. And he's trying to warn Judah that what happened to Israel will inevitably, inexorably happen to them unless they are willing to repent. And he begins to try to expose their sin to them. You see, they were unaware of the depth of their sin. Last night, my wife and I attended a paint party at my son-in-law's church. I don't know if you've ever had that great spiritual blessing or not. But they put two canvases in front of you, and, uh, and I'm supposed to paint half the picture, and my wife is supposed to paint the other half. And so they give you some guidelines, and you go through this whole deal, and then you put the two paintings together. Well, I'm not going to resign my day job and become an artist. Let me just tell you that. But one of the things that I saw was, I'm not much of an artist. You know how I knew that? when I compared my painting to some of the other folks in that room last night. I understood I came up real short. Well, when, when David was talking to Israel, they thought they were pretty good artists. When David really applied this truth to Judah, they thought they were doing pretty good. So he begins to, un, to, to pull the cover and the veil back and let them see their heart. And notice what he says. He says, when you come to appear before me. Now that means when they come to corporate worship. Who, uh, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? He's saying, you're like a, a herd of cows. Instead of coming in uh, to worship me, you just kind of carelessly trampling in. He says, bring no more vain or empty offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the callings of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. He's saying these two just simply don't go together. Iniquity and solemn assembly. Now all of these things that he's saying he doesn't want them to do anymore are things he had commanded them to do. So it wasn't the outward act that was failing, it was the inner motive. They were doing the things outwardly, but their hearts were empty. And so he says to them, your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. Can you imagine that? Your corporate worship burdens me, God said. Wow. He, he said, they have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Church, listen to this. Wash yourselves. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds. And then he lists a number of things. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. These are all action words. They're things that Judah was to do. They were not to ask God to do that for them. They were to take the initiative in doing it. They were to pursue these things. They were to pursue holiness. And then he says in verse 18, come now, let us reason together. Hey, circle that word because it's vital. How many of you know that sometimes the Lord asks us to do things we can't do? Have you, have you discovered that? 
You know why he does that? Because he wants to prove to you that he's the strength and power to do it through you. You see, the Lord didn't save you for you then just to imitate him. For the Christian life is not a life of imitation. He didn't save us and say, now, be like Jesus the best you can. No, he saved us and said, I'm going to come and indwell your humanity with my Holy Spirit so that I can act like Jesus in you because I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, you've got to understand this. Or are you going to really, really walk out of this building today feeling a deep sense of hopelessness? But sometimes we have to come to a place of hopelessness before we ever appreciate the hope we have in Christ. Now, the first thing I see here, he says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. He said, it's a, it's a joint thing. We do this together. Now, what's our part? Submit to him. <laughs> and what's his part? Empower us to do what he asks us to do. Work and do the law demands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. But a sweeter song the gospel brings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. You see, the gospel not only tells me what to do, but it empowers me to do it. In the Old Testament, God kept saying, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And it brought condemnation. Because God was making demands upon them for which they could not fulfill. But in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, God says, this do and you shall live. And in the New Testament, God says, live and you shall do. And so here we have, first of all, what I'm calling the mandate of sanctification. The mandate of sanctification. Uh, Too often, sanctification is treated like it is an option in the Christian life. Now, what do I mean by sanctification? I mean that process in Christian living where we, we, we begin to grow and overcome the power of sin in our life. Now, you do know that when we first get saved, that's called regeneration, God saves us from the penalty of sin. But when we get saved from the penalty of sin, then God expects us to move on in our Christian life to begin overcoming the power of sin in our life. And that's called sanctification. And too often these two truths are held in abeyance. There are many who focus and preach a doctrine of regeneration, but they disconnect it from sanctification. But in the New Testament, you cannot separate the two. One flows into the other. True regeneration begins to work in our heart to produce sanctification. And so it's important that we understand the mandate that God is giving to us. Um, I I, I want you to hear how this is stated in several places scripturally. Uh, First of all, look at what I call the the Baptist preamble, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Look look at it with me here. Look at it. He says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, can you say amen to that? We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. But did you know there was another verse right after that? Have you ever paid any attention to the very next verse? Look what it says in verse 10. For we are his, what church? Workmanship. That's the Greek word poema. It really means you're God's poems. You're God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for what church? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should what? Do them occasionally? That we should walk in them. 
Now, it's so easy for us as Baptists to embrace Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's emblazoned on so many church mottos and, and logos across. But how many times we, we take and embrace Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and we forget Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So that's the mandate. All right, let's look at another one. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Let's begin looking in, in verse 5. It says, uh, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. Now look, notice this. By the washing, remember that from last week? By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That, that's, that's the first two words of the gospel. Wash me. That's being saved. That's when God washes us from the inside out. But now, notice the very next verse. He says, uh, let me, I was looking on the screen. He, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Wasn't that great? Great verses. Have you noticed the next verse? <laughs> look, look at verse 8. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things. Now, notice this is not something meant to be optional. Uh, insist on it. So that those who have believed in God may be careful to what, church? To devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. So good works were never intended to be an option. Salvation was not intended to be a cafeteria line where we go by and take a little of this, and a little of this, and a little of this. It comes as a complete dinner, an eight-course meal. God, but God feeds, us, feeds it all. So uh, he, he's, I'm, I'm just wanting you to get a sense of how the Scripture treats uh, the, the matter of being saved and how it, what it produces in the life. Not what it ought to produce. Now be with me here. What it produces. Look at James chapter 2. Now remember that James is our Lord's half-brother. And James had lived in the very home of Jesus for 30 years before he embraced him as the Son of God. He struggled with this whole idea of who Jesus was. And when James really was saved and God put him as the head of the Jerusalem church and he began to write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the passion of James's heart was to address the need for folks to understand that salvation produces fruit. He had seen so many people who claimed a relationship with God and that relationship was not evident in their life. And so James says in James chapter 2 verse 14, what good is it my brothers if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Now, the King James Version, in the very next verse says, can faith save him? Can faith save him? And that's been a real question. A lot of people have wondered, well, is James saying that we're not saved by faith? Is James pitting himself against the Apostle Paul? Paul says we're saved by grace through faith. And James asks the question, can faith save him? And he's expecting a negative answer. So is the Bible contradicting itself here? Does Paul say one thing and James say another? But if you have the ESV or NASB, you notice that there's a definite article that's placed in the ESV that's not in the King James. He doesn't say, can faith save? He says what? Can that faith save? He's not talking about can faith save. He's talking about a certain kind of faith that does not save. And the kind of faith that does not save is described here. He says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? 
So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, and I've heard someone say this a lots of times. But someone will say, you have faith. I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. Can you do that? Can you show me a pound of faith? <laughs> a gallon of faith? Can you quantify your faith? No. You have to qualify your faith. Your faith is qualified as, as the faith produces. You, you see, faith is a verb as well as a noun. It's not just a noun. When the Bible talks about the faith, it's talking about the content of the Word of God. When the Bible talks about faith, it's talking about an action word that produces. He says, I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one uh, God, and you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, uh, you foolish persons, that faith apart from works is useless? Now, I, I only share those three scriptures with you quickly and each one of them deserves a whole sermon but I want you to see the mandate for sanctification that this is not to be optional in the Christian life and I'm afraid that, afraid that so often in our modern evangelical world we make it an option and we, and we present evangelism in such a shallow way that we it's almost like we present a gospel that says to people, God is hard up and he sure needs your help. <laughs> hey, my dear friend, listen to me. Listen to this Baptist preacher. Pardon my English, but God ain't hard up. God doesn't need anything from me. He's total and complete in his triune self. But in his marvelous grace, he reaches outside of himself. And he gives me and you an opportunity to get in on what he's up to. Yes, yes. And he offers us forgiveness and cleansing and salvation by grace through faith. Thank you, Lord. But then he says, and what I'm asking you to do, if you'll let me, by opening your heart, I will do through you. So I'm glad that that's not the only point in my sermon today. You see, I'm glad it's not just the mandate. Because if, if, if I just had to say to you, now folks, go out there and do it. <laughs> You've heard what the Lord wants you to do. Get at it. Well, there's a part of that in this. But what I really want you to hear is this. God says, this is what I want you to do. And I'm going to help you to do it. So we move, secondly, from the mandate of sanctification. And, and, and by the way, let, let me just take a moment and fill in your, your blank there because some of you folks will really struggle if I don't mention it. Uh, it's stated not only scripturally, it's stated theologically. Uh, positionally, we are sanctified. Uh, when we get saved, God sanctifies us. He puts us in a position of sanctification. In other words, it's something God does for us. He sanctifies us. Let me give you a verse for that. 1 Corinthians 1.30. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification. So there is a sense in which position, in, there's a sense in which we have been sanctified. Are you with me? When we were born again, we were set apart. We have been sanctified. That's called positional sanctification. I didn't have to ask God to do that for me. He did it automatically. When I was a little boy, I had some sanctified shoes. Do you ever have any? Yeah. My mama said, son, these are your Sunday shoes. Right? Anybody else have Sunday shoes? Yeah. You only wear these shoes when you go to church. They're sanctified. They're set apart. Now, that's what it means. Every believer in this room, hey, there's a sense in which you have been sanctified. But can, can, I, can I add to that? There is another secondary sense in the Bible, which means not only you are positionally sanctified, you have been sanctified, but you are practically being sanctified. Are you with me? 
In other words, you have been and you are being sanctified. And the, the, way, the reason you can now be being, that's not good English, but it's good preaching. The reason you can't be being sanctified, uh, the reason you can be being sanctified is because you've already been sanctified. Hey, hey do you know, what, you know what the Christian life is? Listen to this. The Christian life is becoming what I already am. Now, that blow your mind. The Christian life is becoming in practice what I already am in position. It's living out what God has worked in. You remember what Paul said in Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I, I used to think about, that used to bother me as a young Christian. Does that mean Paul is saying we've got to work to be saved? No, no, no. He's saying you, you work out what God worked in. You see, I grew up the son of a sharecropper. And we have to, you know, we did gardens. Hey, do you know, you never work out your field until it's been worked in. You, you never hoe cotton until it's already been planted. Right? And so that's what it means to work out our salvation. It means to take the salvation God has already worked in you and you work it out in a practical way. So that's practical sanctification. Hey, salvation, listen to this. My, my mentor, Ron Dunn, taught me this. Salvation is more than a 30-second experience. It is an initial experience with additional and continuing results. Now let me say that one more time. Salvation is more than a 30-second experience. It is an initial experience with additional and continuing results. Here, here's what frightens me in the modern church, or in the ancient church, as far as that goes. It doesn't matter. It's always been with us. Is that we depend upon a prayer we prayed, an aisle we walked, a card we filled out, and that's what we're hanging on to as our assurance of salvation. Folks, listen to me. Listen to me. Faith that fizzles was probably faulty from the first. Faith animates. It produces good works. Not the same in everybody. And sometimes you've got to look hard to find it. I understand that. I'm not eliminating carnality. I know Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 2 the, the carnal mind and the, and the, the fleshly mind, the spiritual mind. I understand all the but But we can't neglect and ignore a whole body of truth in the New Testament. So there is practical sanctification. Well, uh, P Peter Lord, preacher in Florida, used to say, what we believe, we act upon. Everything else is just religious talk. Can I say that one more time? Say it again. Say it again. What we believe, we act upon. Everything else is just religious talk talk. If you believe it, you act upon it. That's right. Everything else is religious talk. Well, let's go to number two, the manner of sanctification. We gotta, you got to listen a lot quicker. I'm, I'm going to do this real quick. The manner of sanctification. The first question, the mandate answers why. Because God said to. Uh, the manner answers the question, how? How do we do it? And, and look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Important passage. Now may the God of peace himself, here's the word, sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. Look, look, look church. He will surely do it. So here's the manner. God has method in his sanctification. He begins in our spirit. Did you see what 1 Thessalonians 5 said? Sanctify you spirit, soul, and body. Now, when the world gets ready to try to change us, it always reverses that order. Have you noticed that? 
it, it begins with the body. When the body wants to change us, I mean, when the, when the world wants to change us, it begins by, by the body. It making us look better at the gym, dressing better at the men's and ladies' store, feel better physically by eating right, feel better socially by driving the right car, or living in the right house. But too often that amounts to painting the deck of the Titanic, and it does not touch the heart. You see, when God gets ready to change us, he doesn't start changing us on the outside. He starts on the inside. This is dangerous, but I'm going to say it anyway. You know, that's a good, that's a good part of being interim. What you going to do, fire me? You know. Say it, Pastor, say it. Cosmetic surgery is, we're spending billions. It doesn't last. We're spending billions on cosmetic surgery in our culture. And men, don't you look down your long proboscis at your wife. We men are just as guilty as they are. We spend thousands. You know what? We're trying to change the outside. But you know, when God gets ready, he changes the inside. Notice what he says. Spirit, then soul, then body. He begins in the spirit. You must be born again. The Bible says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. That means that when God created man, he lit his candle. <laughs> he lit his spirit. And when Adam sinned, guess what? The candle went out. God begins in the spirit by the rebirth, salvation, regeneration. He works up through the soul, which is the mind, emotions, and will. And it spills out, we'll see it next week, through the body in service. So that, very quickly, that is the, is the manner. That's the way God goes about changing us. And notice that 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, notice it's, it's a prayer. Paul says, I pray, I pray for you that your spirit, soul, and body. Hey, can I ask you something, Christian? Let me ask you this. Who's praying for you? Is there anybody in this room today? You've got a grandmother that's been praying for you ever since you were born. That God would save you and call you to himself. How many of you have got parents who are praying for you? How many of you have got a spouse? You've been praying for your wife or your husband all of your marriage. Paul said, I'm praying for you. One of the great assets. Hey, can I just tell you, don't give up. One of the great assets you have, if somebody loves you enough to pray for you. God wants to begin in your spirit today. He wants you to be born again. He wants you to know Christ in a personal relationship. And he wants those of us who know him to yield our mind for him to think through, our soul for him to fill us with, and our body for him to work through. Well, I must close. Here's the last point. Look at the meaning of, of sanctification. Here's what it means for us. It answers the what question. The mandate answers the why question. The manner answers the how question. The meaning of sanctification, and I'm closing with, this is really the application to the message, really. Call it the last point if you want. The meaning of sanctification. Here's what it means practically. I jotted down two or three things and then we'll close. God is not going to send an angel down to clean up your computer or your magazine rack. Wash yourselves. You're to do that. He's not going to change the channel for you when something ungodly comes on. Wash yourselves. He'll not force you to give up that bitter spirit and forgive that person who offended you. He won't make you do that. He says, wash yourselves. He'll not intervene when you allow yourselves to be in a compromising situation with either drugs or alcohol or sex unless you ask him and want him to. He'll not close your mouth when you're to open it, when you open it to gossip or use your God-given gift of speech to curse his name. 
He's not going to stand over you and hit you with a bolt of lightning. He says, you do it. Wash yourselves. He will not station an angel to watch over you to see that you don't cheat on your taxes. He'll not assign a heavenly messenger to remind you to pray or read your Bible. He'll not write out your tithe check for you. All of these things are things you must do. He will help you by the power of his indwelling spirit, but you must desire it. The second two words of the gospel are these. Wash yourselves.